Welcome um, to Spirit Bear Makes History. We're here today and uh, we're really happy to be with Spirit Bear. Actually, Spirit Bear is coming home. It's his first time home in a long time. Uh, people that may not know Spirit Bear, uh, Spirit Bear is from Northern British Columbia in the Cariacani Territory. And Spirit Bear is making history again. Spirit Bear is known for all the work that he's done on raising awareness for injustices faced by First Nations children. He is also a bear with the very first barrister degree from Osgood Law School. And so now Spirit Bear is, a, is pretty much a movie star. He's going across Canada to share his new film. And he's brought along a, fr a friend of his, a, a really good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Cindy Blackstock. Cindy, of course, is, is well known internationally for her work to, uh, advocating for First Nations children to ensure that there's justice for First Nations children and just a phenomenal woman. She is a director for, the executive director for First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. And so we're really, welcome, we're really happy to have Cindy. And she's, of course, Gick's son. And she's from Northern BC too. So we're really happy to have you home with us. So um, Cindy, as he, Spirit Bear just came back from Ottawa and he's been traveling quite a bit throughout Canada. So can you tell us what he's been up to for the last few weeks? Well, it's been a really busy time because uh, Amanda Strong, who's the incredible animator behind mm -hmm. this, uh, just finished Spirit Bear's first animated film that tells a story about Jordan River Anderson and also how First Nations children and other children came together to, in a courtroom in Ottawa to achieve justice for First Nations kids. A lot of people don't know that First Nations children on reserve get less money for every public service than other kids do. And that's been going on for decades. And that's really what this whole lawsuit was about. So um, being able to kind of share this film, first of all, at the Vancouver International Film Festival. And it was so awesome to be on a panel with Amanda. And of course, the great Ellen Esau Bomsawin, who, for those of you watching, Ellen Esau Bomsawin did a wonderful documentary called Jordan River Anderson, The Messenger. So you can meet Jordan and his family and the whole story. And you can watch it free online. So she was on the panel, as well as Jesse Wente and Spirit Bear and I. And then after that, and that was sold out twice at Fifth, this great animation that just tells you the artistry and the story behind it. Then we did a drive-in premiere. That was the first time I've been to a drive-in. I don't even, all I can remember is Fiddler on the Roof, so that really dates me. But I don't even remember what decade that was. But it was awesome in Ottawa, because it was COVID safe. And we wanted to really, um, in that city, or a lot of the children who actually came to the tribunal, and of course the voice of Spirit Bear, uh, Thielen Kanoskaway was there. So we had a wonderful night. But one of the top priorities was getting back here to Prince George, because this story is so much about this place. And it was such a gift that the song was created by kids from Carrier Secondary Territory. So can you tell us about the first time you met Spirit Bear? What that yeah. day was like, what day it was? <laughs> well, yeah, I remember actually going into your office. And we, had just, uh, we were just about to file this case. And I thought, I have no clue what I'm doing. Right? <laughs> it's like, there's got to be someone out there who knows how the path is going to go. And so I go in and I see you. And we were asking, and kind of just like with the elder kind of approach, you didn't give me that direct, razor sharp answer. You say, hang on a minute, I got just what you need. And you go to the back, I hear this rustling around, and she comes back with this white teddy bear. And I look at him, and he looks at me, and I think, okay. But then, you know, he really took a character because he really symbolized the children. And that's really the message we needed to have, is never forget that this is all about them. And then when the children started coming to the courtroom, of course, they weren't excited to see people like me. They were excited to see this bear. And he's been dressed by children. And he actually does have a whole closet in my office. And in addition to his barrister degree, he has a PAW HD from uh, the University of yes. Victoria in social work. And he has a bear so wise in McMaster. So my whole office has been taken over by all the accomplishments of the bear. And my little piece is getting smaller and smaller. 
Um, but that's the day I remember him. And he's been to all the hearings. This bear has actually been at all hearings, and this case has gone on for 14 years. I remember, because um, we, we traveled out with elders, if you recall. Yeah. We went to Ottawa for the very first day of the tribunal hearings. Yeah. And of course, we were all nervous. Um, and I remember uh, we had, you know, so many file boxes and the federal government came in with um, trolleys and trolleys of boxes of information. And I remember thinking there was myself, uh, you know, I think um, Warner was with us, executive director, a few of the elders, and you and, and just a few lawyers. And there was not very many people there. No. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, like, I'm going to have to tell, you know, when, when, there's, when the federal government was inaccurate. But that was a day, remember, and I lost my voice. Yeah. <laughs> remember, I never lost my voice, and I ended up laryngitis on that day. But I remember thinking, I looked over, and you were there, just cal calm as a cucumber. And then you go into your bag, and everybody's getting their filing stuff, and then you pull out Spirit Bear, and you put him right in front. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was his first day. I that was his that first day. Yeah. And I kept on turning him around. Yes. Right? So if you watch, actually, <laughs> Ellen Nisa's other documentary, is We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice which tells the story of how everyone collectively came together for justice. Uh, you'll see he's at different angles. And at some points, I wondered if the federal government thought that, you know, he had a camera in him or something, mm -hmm. you know, because he would be following along. Because I really wanted him to be a witness, right? And um, I'm just so grateful for this little bear, mm -hmm. this gift of this little bear, because he's become such a treasured kind of way of being able to convey the children's stories. And also so grateful to you and to everyone at Carrier Seconding for all your support this mm -hmm. last 14 years and counting mm -hmm. to try and get justice. We're not there yet. I think that's what the end of the story will tell you that we're getting there, but we're not there yet. I think, um, and if I recall, I remember when, you know, we dropped the writ, we're going to go to court, because of course I was, uh, I represented BC, I still do yeah. on the society, and when we had our board meeting, I'm thinking, okay, well, this is two years and then we're going to be done. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, 14, 15 years later. And I think you should tell people that we are actually still in court. Yeah, we are still in court. Um, in 2016, and you'll see this in the story, uh, that w the children won the case. And Canada was ordered to stop its discriminatory behavior and implement something that's very sacred in this film called Jordan's Principle, which is to ensure that First Nations children can access the services they need when they need them. Um, Canada came out, they welcomed the decision, and then they did nothing. And so we've now had over a dozen orders against the Canadian government. And we're still litigating. Um, the good news, though, is at every turn, the children win. You know, and I think that this has been the power of this case. Uh, you really remember with the Caring Society, we got all of our funding cut within mm -hmm. 30 days of filing it. And there were times we didn't know if we would make it, seriously. But what, whenever we were in one of those dark times, the right person would step forward, or the right idea, or we were about to do something wrong and the right teaching would come. And I really think that that spiritual guidance is still there in a big way. And it really is embodied. That's why his name is Spirit Bear, <laughs> is he really uh, embodies that. And I want us all to remember that. Of all of those people who have come before us, who are passing down the, the strength, uh, multi-generational strength to this generation of kids, and the need for all of us to honor them and to honor the residential school survivors and the 60 scoop survivors and all the families that love those children. Um, I think it's really important part of the story. And uh, so as we continue to litigate against Canada, uh, I'm pretty sure all those ancestors and spirits are in that courtroom with us. And I think that's why the children always win. Canada okay. always fights, but we, the children always win. I think that's what's um, really amazing is, is, is that feeling of that this is our case. And I, I do definitely know when, uh, when Canada, when there was no more funding for the society to exist, <laughs> I think all of us board members ended up with more gray hair just because of that. How do we function? And yet money just kept coming in. And I remember um, because we did a donation drive even within Cary Sicani. Yeah. And, you know, it was, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars that came in from one conference. It was just, it was phenomenal. And, of course, the directors here and the executive directors of agencies in BC all came together to, to support the, the important work. And so I, I think it really um, shows that, you know, what one person or a group of, of a collective of people could, could make change. And I think the, the phenomenal thing, Cindy, is that people don't understand the... Um, 
internationally, like it's one of the first yeah. times a first world country has been charged with discrimination and the citizens of the country have won. This is the only case. Yeah, you know, like, and, and it's being watched worldwide. We actually have been so blessed during the history of this case to have uh, people come from Australia, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander for people from Australia. Uh, the Maori have been looking at this case as a way of trying to unlock some of the same kinds of discrimination that are experienced by Indigenous peoples worldwide. And I need to also say thank you to them because they have been a support as well. I remember the day we started the opening, uh, the second round of opening statements, because mm -hmm. it, it's a long story, but there were two rounds, and one that we started it the first time and it got kicked out of court and we had to come back four years later. But on the, when we actually started the hearing, that, it was a day before in New Zealand, and a group of Maori children in their daycare center actually did the haka. So that was the very first part of the opening ceremony wow. because they were, they were up far earlier than us, and so they were starting that spiritual energy. And then there were children in Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in Australia, that had all their stuffies around them, and they were sending messages of support to Spirit Bear because they know all about Spirit Bear. And so, yeah, they had their koalas and their sacred animals, like their platypus and their crocodile. And so there were children all over the world uh, sending good energy and community members. Uh, it's been a blessing. And as you say, all throughout the country. The kids always call this uh, it our case. And when the children won, one of the stories that we don't have in the film but did happen, is they would call it, they would come to the hearings and they would say, how's our case coming? Are we going to win? And um, I said, what are we going to do when we win, they asked. And I said, well, we're going to have a party, right? And uh, so we waited and waited for the hearing, uh, for the decision to come out. And then, of course, they, we won. And then the first thing happens, I get calls to school, when's the party? And so we brought the kids' committee together, and they decided the perfect place to hold this victory party was right inside of Parliament. So that's exactly what we did, is we rented the space in the middle of the Parliament. We had nice lunch. We invited everybody who came to the hearings. We had a big cake. And, you know, the children were so clear, Mary. They just said, this is good that we won. But it doesn't mean much unless it makes it's real in the lives mm -hmm. of other children. So we got to keep writing letters. We got to keep showing up until it's real. And I think the whole, um, the whole campaign, I Am a Witness, it, it talks, it speaks to that. Yeah, you know, that's, that, that was one of those spiritual things, right? I was thinking, how many cases have we had, First Nations cases, go to the Supreme Court, and they're argued in darkness. And in my view, discrimination's best friend is silence and darkness. So how was it that, given that we were broke, how was it that we were going to share this case and keep it in a limelight and show Canada's discrimination to the world? And it was as simple as this I Am a Witness campaign. So we load up all of Canada's court documents, all of ours. And we don't ask the public to take a side. We just say, watch because we're really convinced that anyone who really sees it, it's the, the discrimination is just so obvious. And then through that process, I had helped educate a lot of other people. And, at the same, and later on, we had the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and now the Murdered Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Report. And so I really feel that those different types of gatherings have added to the public conversation about it. Uh, but it's also put a bigger responsibility on all of us because although we started this really with Jordan's principle in child welfare, we now realize that even if we achieve equity in Jordan's principle in child welfare, unless we deal with the fact that First Nations don't have clean water in many cases, that only 35% of First Nations have broadband access, that schools are underfunded, that language is underfunded, just playgrounds and places to have fun are underfunded, Unless we deal with all of that together, then I think the discrimination is going to continue to pile up on the hopes and dreams of families. So uh, that's why we got the Spirit Bear Plan. I think, and I think this this case is precedent setting in education and in Indigenous yeah. education. I think if we get it right now, then it would be easy just to go back to court for education to get equity oh, yeah. in other in, in other social sectors. Um, what, what I, I think what really when I talk about this the inequity, what well, what do you mean, Mary? And for me, practically, you have to remember, I was executive director all those years ago, mm -hmm. and I remember coming in and 
saying, what do you mean I can't pay my social workers as much as an MCFD yeah. worker? Like sometimes it was $4, and in some cases when it was a team, it was $6 less because I could barely make any money. So when you would try to say, so the ministry, as you know, the province would be able to say, all right, in order for you to keep your children with you, you have to go to anger management, you have to have another bedroom, you have to have food, you have to have this. We didn't have, as indigenous agencies, that money to do that work. Yeah. So that inequity, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, my God, this is, we have to stop this. How is it that I can't even retain workers because, you know, and, 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 and bless my staff's heart, like and across Canada, yeah. many of the workers stayed because they believed in the work that we did, not because of money, because if it was for the money, they sure wouldn't <laughs> have been working for us back in the day. And so now we've come to the place where there is, a, like, definitely the federal funded children and, and you know, the same funding should be given to the, the province. So now we have to deal with the province. There is inequity with, within the province of BC. And again, that we can't stand for that. So I think moving forward, we really need to look at, I think, for all the um, provincial and territorial governments that we need to implement all the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal rulings. It is a federal ruling, but I think in the, prov yeah. the provinces, it's different. So if they would just say, many of the provinces, like British Columbia, are, are saying, yes, we are going to implement the, the United Nations or Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. Well, the first way you do that is reconciliation, and, and, and you have to ensure there's equity for First Nations children are most vulnerable, and that's not happening within the provinces right now. So again, that's another battle that I think we have to, we have to really, we have to forge on with. But I just want to talk a little bit about Spirit Bear Plan because to me it makes perfect sense. Yeah. But if you could tell us what Spirit Bear Plan is. Well, for, uh, as I say, 153 years, we've had these inequalities across all these public services. And the public really knew very little about that, right? They were kept it, they actually, they were spun a stereotype by government that First Nations get more, not less. Uh, but the reality is from the Auditor General and everybody else and these legal rulings, it's far less. And so what was happening is Canada would come under political pressure, say, in education. And they would add a little bit more money, but it still would be far less than what non-Indigenous kids got. And then the next year, they would get under pressure for water. Oh, well, we're going to throw some money at water. But just topic by topic and drop by drop in, in, in a way that First Nations children and families never got equality. So the Spirit Bear Plan says two things. One is we got to figure out why the Department of Indian Affairs doesn't do better when it knows better. Uh, like, how many reports of everybody across the country have been shuffling in there and says, here's a problem, here's the solution, fix it. Um, and they don't do it. So what is happening in the psychology of that government where they're just unable to implement things that make sense? The second part, though, is let's cost out all those inequalities. And let's do something like the Marshall Plan after the Second World War and get rid of all of them. Why should a First Nations child spend one day getting one penny less than anybody else? And they're getting far less than that. And the other great thing about the Spirit Bear Plan, I don't know about you, Mary, I'm really happy that there's more investments in safety net for people during COVID. But they're spraying money everywhere. I didn't even know the government of Canada had all this cash. So what that's showing me is that it was always possible to treat First Nations children fairly. They just chose not to. And that's why the general public, it's so important that they don't let up on their members of parliament or their, uh, as you say, also their MLA sitting there in Victoria, that people keep on demanding that this type of racial discrimination against children ends. I think um, people don't realize that when we talk about this inequity and discrimination, it's happening still today. It's still happening. And, and Cindy, you know, you've traveled across the country, and I, I, I really had the, the good fortune to travel across Canada um, in the last six months before COVID started. You know, I've been up to Nunavut, I went, went to Attawapiskat. What really, really surprised me was the, um, was the, the actual lack of services in, in the northern reaches oh. of, of the country. When I went up to Attawapiskat, and, and I love Attawapiskat, I would yeah. go back there in a heartbeat. I, I love the people there, the resilience and, and the territory. And when I got there, they said, well, you can't take a shower. And if you do, you have to keep the window open and you can only take a cold shower for a minute. Yeah. And you can't drink the water and you can't do the... I said, what are you talking about? We're staying at this little, little um, hotel. Rooming house, yeah. Yeah, it was like a rooming house. 
and we had to bring our own water up. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, this is why. And it's been like this for, for months and months and months. And here we have this diamond mine that made billions and billions of dollars and nothing to fix the water, the, the water situation. And what I was really uh, surprised of just when we got there, and this was just about five months ago, is people were saying in the newspaper, well, they should just move. They yeah. should just move. And I'm like, this is the child. It's their inherent right to stay where they were. This is their traditional territory that it was, you know, uh, contaminated. And that, that inequity, that would never stand. Could you imagine in downtown West Vancouver? Would they have to say, oh, wait a minute, you only take a one-minute cold shower because it's too, it's too bad for you, it's not good for you. And they have babies with, with you know, skin diseases, they have you know, dental problems. This is many places in the country. It's worse than third world in some situations, I would say. You know what, uh, in Ontario, northern Ontario, that's where Attawapiskat is. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is where Shannon Q. Statchin, the great education advocate, mm -hmm. lived and grew up before she passed away, and she inspired so many kids to stand up for what she called safe and comfy schools. But uh, when Shannon was advocating for a school, because the school in, the school in, uh, in Attawapas got sat on a toxic waste dump of 30,000 gallons of diesel fuel, and the government of Canada brought up portable trailers and put them on the playground of that contaminated school, and that's what Shannon was fighting against. At the same time where she was advocating for that, and this would be around 2008, 2009, an international aid organization came up to Northern Ontario to assess whether those communities met that definition for international aid. Mm -hmm. And uh, the assessor, it actually just came from South Sudan, and came up to those communities and felt that those conditions were equivalent to what he saw in South Sudan. And that's right here, right? I think that people really just don't appreciate they think somehow, I think they've been spun this misinformation. When they look at a, a community in that much, under that much pressure, they think it's a choice. The community's choosing not to do it. But if uh, we were to, well, we're sitting here in Prince George. If you and I were co-mayors today and we cut everybody's public services down by 50 to 30 percent, and one in six households didn't get water for 20, 25 years, um, then people would start to get a sense of what it actually looks like to be in one of those communities, right? It's completely unethical. It's apartheid, really, in Canada. And that's why we have to really put it in the crosshairs of our social justice action. I think what was, what throughout this whole time, Cindy, what I really um, appreciated was how a lot of the non-Indigenous children yeah. across Canada and the non-Indigenous schools came up and they said, okay, we're going to fundraise. Yeah. I thought that was just amazing. Yeah, just uh, actually just before I came here, uh, these little kids in Toronto did a lemonade stand, right, for uh, Spirit Bear um, because they want to see a part of it. And I think that's the thing, you know. Kids at the age of two developmentally know about fairness. Mm -hmm. And if we really are able through uh, th films like this and the gift of Spirit Bear, really nurture that in children, then they're going to grow up to be like many of the kids who came to mm -hmm. this case, and that is to understand this unfairness issue, not from a charity issue, but from an issue of fundamental justice. And what the kids would say to me is they said, we don't want to grow up in a world where we leave our friends behind. That's amazing. So, um, Kenise, speaking about youth, so the Carrier Sikani Family Services, how, how did oh. the youth help oh, in this movie? This is so awesome. So, Spirit Bear, of course, always needs, a, every movie needs a theme song, Barry, right? Yeah. And um, we were wondering, who do we get to do this theme song? I mean, and, and also, I don't know if it shows, but I'm pretty protective of Spirit Bear, because now he's kind of sacred, right? Uh, who could we trust with actually writing his song and recording it? And, there were, and to me, it was clear that we had to go back to where the bear is from. Right? And we work with this amazing music producer, David Hodges, who does great work with young people and with children to write and record music that matters. And so uh, we thought that's what we're going to do, right? And uh, we started this process in January, and then COVID struck. And then we're kind of wondering, as David usually comes and works directly with young people to do these songs. Um, and we didn't know how we'd pull it off. But, you know, using Zoom, and then David was able to join you, and I'm telling you, these lyrics just, these lyrics, I think, really come from that spiritual place. Because when I read the lyrics for the first time, it was about as if 
they had witnessed all of that case, that they had drawn out the most important messages, and um, they were able to put it to music. It is absolutely breathtaking. And um, I have to admit, it's one of those songs. Everybody, uh, we just showed it at the drive-in, and one of the gentlemen who came with his young son said all the way home, he was, he was singing the Spirit Bear song. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we want to see. We want to see children of all diversities all across this country and joining the great music that was composed and performed by kids from Carrier Secondary mm -hmm. Territory. And we have one of the singers here, Sloan Volk, who is in our audience today. Yeah, yeah thank which you. is awesome. And yeah. thank you so much for doing it, for trusting us to do it. Uh, and being a part of it, because you really have made a difference. And that theme song, we're not changing it. So for every Spirit Bear film, it's going to be in there. And um, we are going to make sure that it's shared far and wide, and it educates all kinds of kids. Cool. So before we start the film, Cindy, you have a surprise. Yeah, video. A surprise video. By the way, everybody, it is Mary's birthday today. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> and Birthday. Uh, Birthday, yes. yeah, birthday, and because uh, Mary also is a is a voice of the film in the film. Mary, she's Mary the Bear, um, and so we want to do something special. So we got a little video. So let's show it. But I, I would have done without the mud picture or the bad <laughs> one. Yeah, no, but that's the best part. Everybody <laughs> thinks it's the best part. Um, so, Cindy, um, introduce the movie now. Well, All right. So, this is a, a movie made by the great uh, Spotted Fawn Productions, an Indigenous animation studio. Everything you're about to see is handmade. For every uh, 13 seconds of film, it took these artists one day of work to produce. And it tells this true story of how children of all diversities came together with many others in that courtroom to achieve justice for First Nations children. And, to, and it also shares the story of Jordan River Anderson, the young boy who founded Jordan's Principle. And that's that principle where First Nations children get access to services they need when they need them. So uh, it's a very special film. And it's, taught, it's told through the eyes of Spirit Bear because he saw it all happen. So, and we have, uh, of course, you are Mary the Bear, and I sneak in as Cindy the Sheep. And people wonder why we have a sheep, but there's actually a real Cindy the Sheep. So anyway, we can talk about that later. So <laughs> let's watch this one. We have together. to watch it, but I just, I really have to say how honored I am all to, to share the stage with you, Cindy. And uh, people need to know this, that Cindy wrote that book. We actually had an author that was going to... Um, going to write the book, and that, that kind of fell through. And Cindy said, the story has to be done. So <laughs> she wrote the book, um, and then that book spawned this, this animation movie. And just um, always, always just honored to be in your presence for all the work that you do for all our children, not only in Canada and BC, but internationally. So thank you. And this really is an homage to you, Cindy. Well, thank, thank you. you. And, and you uh, also can get the book and carrier. Yeah, we can get the book and carrier. Just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's start yeah, the let's movie. Here is Spirit Bear and Children Make History. Friends, it's nice to see you here. My name is Mary the Bear, and this is my son Spirit Bear, or Sestzel in the carrier language. His birthday is on May 10th. He was born in 2007. He has three sisters, Era Bear, Cedar Bear, and Mamengwe Bear. We are members of the Carrier Sikani Tribal Council in British Columbia. 
I work with people at Carrier Sikani Child and Family Services to help children and families feel healthy and proud. Spirit Bear is a barrister, and his job is to help kids like you stand up for the fair treatment of First Nations children. Spirit Bear and I believe that children can change the world because we saw it happen. In 2008, when he was just a little cub, Spirit Bear made the long trip to Ottawa, Canada's capital city, to witness a very important human rights case. He went to watch, listen, and stand up for First Nations kids. And Spirit Bear wasn't the only one. This is a story how kids, kids just like you, can make a difference, and how bears and other animals helped along the way. I love kids and hugs and huckleberries. Did you know that the government of Canada is supposed to look after all the children who live here equally? The problem is it doesn't. For a long time, First Nations kids have been getting less money than other children for things they really need, like health care, education, help for families, and even basics such as clean water. In February of 2007, the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, called the Caring Society for short, and the Assembly of First Nations went to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal to try and change that. A tribunal is like a court where groups can go to try and solve a problem. People from the First Nations and the Government of Canada talked to the tribunal members, who are like judges, to explain their sides of the story. The Government of Canada tried to stop the tribunal from hearing the case. It took six years for the hearing to officially start, almost two years for the hearing itself, and then over a year for a decision to be made. That's nine years. <laughs> That's a really nice try. <laughs> Thank you. I teach cubs as much as I can. I teach them that when they see someone being treated badly, they need to go learn about it and do what they can to help make things better. Shh, the class is about to start. Sus? 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 Bear? Bear? Zal? Zal? Even though he was just a little cub, I knew that Spirit Bear, like all children, understood fairness. I told him about the human rights case at the tribunal and he wanted to do something to help. He decided that he would go to Ottawa to witness the case and stand up for the fair treatment of First Nations kids. He took the train, his favorite way to travel, for a very long journey from Carrier Sikani territory in Northern British Columbia. I was so proud of him. I believe that children can change the world. After a long journey, Spirit Bear made it to Ottawa in the province of Ontario. Ottawa is on the unceded land of the Algonquin First Nations, and the name of the city comes from the Algonquin word Adawe, which means trade. Cindy! Cindy! Hi, Spirit Bear! It's so nice to see you. Are you here for the human rights case too? I am. There are First Nations people from all across Canada here too. But where's everyone else? I wish more people would help. 
I'm glad you're here too, Spirit Bear. The Caring Society and Assembly of First Nations filed this case so that First Nations children and families have the help they need to get through hard times from Child Welfare Services, like other children in Canada. These services are meant to keep kids safe, at home with their families, and connected to their culture. Cindy also told Spirit Bear about a very special boy named Jordan River Anderson from Norway House Cree Nation in Manitoba. Jordan was born in 1999 with a serious health condition. Doctors said he needed to stay in the hospital so they could help him. When Jordan turned two years old, doctors said he could go home but needed some medicines and helpers there to keep him healthy. The governments of Manitoba and Canada argued for a long time over the money to pay for the things Jordan needed to go home. They argued for so long that Jordan got sick again and passed away. Jordan's family wanted to make things better for other kids, so we created Jordan's principal, and Jordan's teddy bear wanted to help. So when you want to learn more about Jordan's principal, just look for the blue bear. Jordan's principle is a rule saying that arguments about money should not stop kids from getting the help they need. Jordan's principle says that First Nations children should get the help they need, like visits to doctors or extra help in school, when they need it. It's what this tribunal case is all about. Only Cindy the Sheep and Spirit Bear are watching as the government tries to stop the tribunal from hearing about the unfairness to First Nations kids. I'm glad I have you here with me, Cindy. We're not alone, Spirit Bear. The ancestors are with us, and soon they will call other people to come as well. And just like that, Cindy and Spirit Bear are no longer alone. A group of high school students have come to bear witness and learn what's going on, so they can tell others about what's happening and how they can help. Hi, Spirit Bear. Hi, Cindy. Hi there. We heard about the case, and we are here to let people know that all children matter. We want First Nation children to know that they are not alone. The students invite their families and friends to come watch. Soon the tribunal hearing room is full of young people of all ages. They give Cindy and Spirit Bear lots of hugs and tell them what they are learning. 
It was such a great day because I knew then that First Nations kids would never be alone again. It's not right that First Nations have to fight for things all other people in Canada enjoy. We wrote a recipe for how to treat First Nations kids. 40 cups of clean water for every child, infinity cups of not breaking law, 80 billion cups of love, 10 cups of clothes, 10,000 cups of education, 15 cups of school supplies for each child, 700 bowls of food, 10,000 cups of healthcare and doctors, 15,000 cups of hospitals, 9,999 cups of money, 10,000 cups of peace. That's right. Cindy and I are so happy you're here. We're going to invite other kids and teachers to come witness the case with us. Just because we're small doesn't mean we can't stand tall. Children have power and can change the world. It's Valentine's Day and the government is still trying to stop the tribunal from taking on the case. Hundreds of children are on Parliament Hill. They've planned a big event called Have a Heart Day. They've written letters asking the government of Canada to have a heart for First Nations children. This letter to the Prime Minister asked the government to end the discrimination and start making changes so First Nations children have a fair chance to grow up safely with their families, get a good education, be healthy, and feel proud of who they are. They're right. First Nations know what is best for their children and communities. I have wonderful news. My sister, Era Bear, has come to live with me. you. I missed you too, Era. Ah. I have so much to tell you. I learned so much since I last saw you. That sounds exciting. I love my family. I love being with family too, Spirit Bear. All children should have the chance to grow up safely at home. Tell me about your trip to Ottawa. Well, on my way to Ottawa, I met with some Indigenous grown-ups. They were sharing stories about the way they were treated as children by the government with a group called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Many were treated badly and the stories were sad. I learned a lot about the unfair way Indigenous peoples have been treated. And I learned that helping to fix the unfairness, it is called reconciliation. has lots of calls to actions to help learn from the past so we can do a better job respecting Indigenous people's rights, cultures, and languages. Did you know there are over 50 Indigenous languages in Canada? That's a lot of ways to say spirit bear. 
Yes, and every one of those languages has all kinds of knowledge in them. That's why we need to make sure all First Nations children can speak their languages, so the knowledge won't be lost. How should we get started, Spirit Bear? Well, when we work together, we are stronger. Everyone repeat after me. We can all help make the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action real. After years of the government trying to stop the case, the tribunal has agreed that it can officially go ahead starting today. The hearing room is packed. There are new faces and kids who have been here before, but have grown a lot bigger than when we last saw them. Oh. <gasps> Beer Bear! Wow, you're all so much bigger. I'm so very happy to see you. We missed you. Spirit Bear, we brought something for you. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! The tribunal hearings are finally over. Now we have to wait for the tribunal's decision. I don't like waiting. I get butterflies in my stomach. <gasps> but the good memories of the children I've met who've held me, told me their stories and dressed me up make me happy. Plus now, I have more clothes than Cindy the sheep, and she loves fashion. I am very happy. After nine years, the tribunal ruled that First Nations children must get proper funding for the help they need. My friends are cheering and say they will keep working until the change actually happens. Yay! Yay, Spirit Bear! We did it! It's Spirit Bear's ninth birthday today or birthday in the bear world. We've planned a big party for this special day. Cindy is here along with other children and grown-ups. They've brought their bears with them to help spread the word about Jordan's principle. Teddies were Jordan's favorite toy. We've invited people across the country to join in and bring their bears to daycare, school, or work too. We call it Bear Witness Day. Happy birthday, Spirit Bear. Yeah, happy birthday, Spirit Bear. Oh, wow. My own teddy bear. Thank you. I will take good care of him. It's August 1st now. Cindy and Spirit Bear are at the Norway House Cree Nation where Jordan's family lives for the Jordan's Principal Parade. Every year, children gather their teddies to march in a parade to celebrate Jordan's Principal. <laughs> a 
After 10 long years learning about the unfair way First Nations kids are treated, my son is getting an honorary barrister degree from Osgoode Law School. It's for his courageous support and bearing witness throughout a long and difficult process of truth-telling and healing. Everyone at the Carrier Sikani Tribal Council is very proud of Spirit Bear. I'm super proud of all the children who stood up for fairness at the tribunal. As the children say, just because we're small doesn't mean we can't stand tall. After all, no one would think a bear could be a barrister, but here I am. Yay, Spirit Bear! We made this banner for you, Spirit Bear. Many First Nations children still don't get the things other kids get, like safe and comfy schools, proper health care, and clean drinking water. Let's join hands and paws and hooves to work together until every First Nation child is treated fairly. Remember, every child matters. You matter. Yes, you matter.
Wow. So what do you think? That's the first time seeing it. Yeah, I can't stop crying. It's beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. It was amazing. Isn't that theme song, though, just perfect for that yes, film? Absolutely. It was almost as if they had seen the film before they wrote that theme song. And I think it just really captures it. And so I find myself always thinking about it and in my head, playing it in my head. And uh, it just makes the work so much more important. So I'm so grateful. And you, you make a fine Mary the Bear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Cindy, now we have this film. What, what's, the, what's the future hold? Well, um, actually, in your birthday film, uh, there's a picture of Mary and I standing with this kind of bush-looking bear. And I took that bear home. I, my mom lives here in Prince George. I went to Kelly Road uh, Secondary, you know. And uh, mom said, that's Huckleberry. So the next film is actually going to be based on this Uncle Huckleberry, which you also gave to us. So you just got to keep the bears coming yes. and the films that come. <laughs> And this one is going to be on Shannon's Dream, the great Shannon Kustachian we talked about earlier. So that's coming the next film. And then after that, one about residential schools and the TRC survivors. And then after that is about the removal of John A. McDonald's statues. How, how do we learn from the past? And how can we tell a more balanced uh, story of history? And I'm just thinking about what I might write the next one about. And I'm thinking I might do it on, uh, to honor the women who have been murdered and missing. Uh, that might be the next story. Because I think one of the things that people don't realize is that children can be trusted with the truth. Uh, you just have to do it in a way that is respectful. And you have to base the storytelling in love, which is what the elders have always said. So that's what's coming up next. So this, this little bear isn't done yet. And of course, we have to go back to court. And we're still litigating in Can with Canada. And a uh, huge shout out to everyone who's been a part of this case. It truly is our case. Mm -hmm. I think I'll leave it with um, some words of, uh, of out of the mouths of babes, as you say. So a little 11-year-old uh, boy uh, in the work that I do, he said what he dreamt about. We asked, what do you dream for? And he says, I dream about the day that I just have to read about residential school, not have to live it. Wow. And that, I think, is Cindy, some of the work that you're doing. That's where we're getting it. And your tireless advocacy and your tenacity, all like decades of it, Cindy, in this, this court case. I know you've been there. Every day you live, breathe, and eat what you, what you, what you, what you want to see for the world. You, you, you make change. And I think um, when we think about you know, these, these young children that are making change in the world, Cindy, couldn't have done it without you. You're making massive changes in the world for all children. And again, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. And I know we all feel that way. So thank you again for this film, Spirit Bear and Children Make History. Thanks, yeah. Cindy. Bye, everyone.